now and we can hit our getting point with that same URL and we get back hello world. Excellent. If I just change my body now to be hello YouTube, we will get that item saved response. And if I hit my get endpoint again, I get hello YouTube. And we've now got multiple endpoints on the same API deployed within the same Rust project. Hello and welcome to another video on building serverless applications on AWS with Rust. In this video, we're going to have a look at how you can build out a more complete API using Lambda and Rust. If you remember in the last video, and if you haven't seen the last video, it will be floating around up here somewhere. We got started with a brand new Rust project and it looked something like this. We have our main entry point for our binary, and then we actually have our handler, our business logic to create an item in DynamoDB. But what happens now if we want multiple endpoints on our API? Because remember with this binary, we're just gonna get an executable that comes out called Bootstrap, and this main function here is going to be the entry point. Thankfully, Rust has some features that allow us to build multiple binaries. So let's have a look at how we can do that. If we just flick over to the Rust documentation, you can see we have this binaries section that we can specify in our cargo.toml. And the default binary for Rust is the source main.rs file. And we have that. That's the entry point to our application. But actually, you can use this binaries configuration to add additional binaries to the application that will get generated at the point where we build. And we can use this to have a single Rust project that actually builds all of our different API endpoints. And it also allows us to share some logic between the different endpoints. So let's have a look at how we can do that. If we just close all this down for a second, and the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new folder under my source folder called bin. And then within there, I'm gonna create a file called createhandler.rs. This is the endpoint that we want to use to create a new item in our DynamoDB table. And I'm gonna grab all of the contents of my main.rs file and paste that into my create handler. So now I've just moved all of that business logic from my main file into this file under the bin. And I'm actually gonna rename this to be lib.rs. So then we've actually got this shared library that we can use to share any code, any structs, any handlers between our different Lambda entry points. And within this lib.rs, remember this is now the public API of our library. Let's just create a new struct and we'll call this shared item. And our shared item is going to have one string property. And we'll use this to demonstrate that we can share things between our different entry points. So I'm gonna create a second entry point now and let's call this um, gethandler.rs. And I'm actually gonna, as a start, I'm just going to grab all of the code from my create handler and just pop that into my get handler and we can use this as the base to start from. So we've still got our config being loaded, we've still got our DynamoDB client be created, but what we actually want to do here is change the name of this function from put item to get item. And this is going to get an item from DynamoDB. Okay, so we'll come back to the logic in here in just a second, but we've now got our two handlers. We've got our endpoint to create items and we've got an endpoint to get items. And we're building out a simple CRUD API at this point. So let's just have a quick look at what we need to change in our cargo.toml file. So this is what it looks like as a default. And when you compile your Rust application, you get a binary with the name of the package specified at the top. And what I'm actually gonna do now is underneath here, I'm gonna add that bin setting where I can specify a custom binary. I can give my binary a name, so let's call it create, and I can specify the path to the file. So it's under source, bin, and then we've got create underscore handler, create underscore handler dot rs. So that's one of our binaries. And then if I just copy and paste that code for our get endpoint, and that's gonna be get handler dot rs. So at the point I 
build this application now, I'm actually gonna get two binaries that get generated. I'm gonna get one under create handler and I'm gonna get one under get handler. And we can have a look at that in just a minute when I compile the application. But let's get back to our application code in this get item endpoint. And what I'm going to do is just get rid of some of these tests, these test classes just for the moment. So we'll get rid of them tests there. And let's actually work through this logic. So instead of extracting the body, I still want to read a path parameter. So I'm going to get an ID from my path parameter. And then instead of doing a put item, I'm going to make a get item call. And then I'm going to specify my key, which is just down there. And let's say my key is called PK. What did we use when we created it? If I just look at my create handler, let's have a look at what we used. So we used a value called ID. So I'm going to get my ID and then I'm going to use attribute value and it's a string attribute value, not a string set. And then in there, I will pass in my ID to string. So we've now got our get item logic. And then down here in our response, this is where we're actually going to return the item that gets retrieved from, um, from DynamoDB. And what I'm going to do in here is I'm going to get my query result out of there. And let's turn, give this a body, something like that. And we can return this response. And then from here, I need to get my uh, payload. So I'm going to use query result. And then we've got an attribute called payload. If we look at our create handler, you see we're actually putting the body of our request into the payload attribute. So I want to get payload here, and that's going to be as a string. And then I just want to unwrap that and make that into a string. Oh, that needs to be dot item. We want the item of our payload, and there we are. So now we've got our payload item um, that also needs to be unwrapped. And there we are. So we've got our payload here. And then instead of just saying item saved, we can just pass our payload. So then the payload will get returned to the caller. So we've got our create handler here that's actually going to create records in DynamoDB. And this was just taken from the example we had in the first video. And then we've added this additional get handler and this is going to actually retrieve items from DynamoDB. I'm just gonna change this slightly just to put an expect in there so that we get an error just if the payload doesn't exist. Payload attribute should exist. And then we can actually use that um, down here like that. Um, do, 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 just like that. There we go. So now we're just, we're just making sure that, we, that the, the, the payload attribute actually exists with this expect method. And then we can return our payload as we were doing before. Okay, so let's have a look at what happens when we compile this now. So I'm gonna go back to my terminal and I'm going to run my make build command. And this is actually now gonna go off and compile my application. And you can see that the compiler is compiling two things here. It's compiling both a get and a create binary. And these are the two things that we specified, if you remember, in our cargo.toml file. We've got a create binary and a get binary. That has completed now, let's just clear that. And if we go back to Visual Studio Code, you'll be able to see if we look under our target, under the Lambda folder, we now have both a create and a get binary. We've got this Rust sample one hanging around from previously, so I can just get rid of that binary as well. So we've now got our two um, executables. So let's now go and update our SAM template. So now we've currently got this put function in our template, and instead of that pointing to Rust sample, we want that to point to our create folder. And then I'm going to just duplicate that entire section, rename that to be get function. And of course, that's going to come from our get folder. If we remember it, target lambda get, excellent. And then I just need to change that to a get request and also change my policy to be a DynamoDB read policy because you want to be able to read from the table, not write to it. 
there. So now we have everything we need to deploy these multiple endpoints into AWS. So let's go off and do that now. So let's flick back over to our terminal. And because we've already got our code compiled, we can just run a SAM deploy command. And this is now gonna use AWS SAM to actually go off and deploy this application. So that's finished deploying now. Let's just take it for a quick test drive. So let's grab the API URL there. And I'm gonna pop that API endpoint in there. And remember, we need to specify an ID for the item we're gonna create. So let's just say one, two, three, four, five, six. And I'm gonna make that put request now and I get my response back in 175 milliseconds. It's fast, of course. And we've got an item created. Excellent. So now we know our logic work exactly the same, even though we've moved that to be in its own binary as opposed to in that main.rs file. So let's just check our get endpoint now and we can hit our get endpoint with that same URL and we get back hello world. Excellent. If I just change my body now to be hello YouTube, we will get that item saved response. And if I hit my get endpoint again, I get hello YouTube. And now we have an API with multiple endpoints. Excellent. Let's just have a quick look now how we can share code between these multiple different endpoints. And I've actually gone to the trouble of adding another endpoint now. So within our API, we now have a create, a delete, and a get endpoint. So now we can do the various different CRUD operations that we would need to do. And let's have a look at this shared item. So we've got this shared struct called shared item in our lib.rs. And this is where we can put any shared application code. So let's come into my create handler now. And let's say I want to use my shared item. So in my create handler, let's just create here. I'll put the top and let's just say let uh, shared item equals shared item. And we can drop that in there. And then we can say that the, uh, what was the property called again? I can't remember, text, excellent, which isn't actually a public. So let's make that a public property there and then we can say the text equals hello and that needs to be a string from hello and we can use that same shared item struct across all of our different endpoints all we need to do is import the value from our shared create and you can see this is where the name of our package still becomes useful so previously the binary that got generated was called rust sample the name that's specified at the top of our package here. Now what we're doing is generating these three binaries with specific names. And if you want to use any shared code, that shared code then comes from our Rust sample library, our package that we've got within our application. And this is where we can start to put any shared methods. Maybe we want to move all our DynamoDB interactions into a shared library. So that's centralized. There's a bunch of different things you can do here. But this is how we can then start to share multiple different pieces of code between our different handlers. So let's just move that same line of code into our delete handler. And all we'll need to do is import that use statement and we can use our shared item over here as well. That is everything for this video. Remember, if you need multiple Lambda functions in the same project because you want to deploy them together, maybe they're part of the same microservice, then you can use this binary folder to actually specify the names of the binaries that you want to generate. And then you can specify any shared code within the actual package itself. As always, if you've liked this video, please like, please subscribe, please comment. I really like hearing from you and I would love to hear what else you want to see with these videos on building serverless applications in Rust. In the next video, we're gonna have a look at how you can test your Rust based serverless application because testing is something that's clearly really important to us as serverless developers and how we can do that in a way that means we can unit test our business logic locally but then test our application actually works against actual cloud resources. I will see you next time.